Okay, let's get started on semantic web and the week of Internet of Things and stuff and all of the bits and pieces. What is the semantic web? Still not a rhetorical question. What's that? It's an extension of the web through standards. Gee, it's almost like you Googled that, and then, and then the Wikipedia page came up, and then you read the first line, which is exactly what you were supposed to do. Bravo, brilliant, excellent. <laughs> That's what it is. What does it mean? If you were going to try to translate into five-year-old speak what semantic web or Internet of Things is, how would you translate it? How would you explain to a five-year-old that stuff is all interconnected now? And what would you do to explain that? Throw hands up and just start guessing at this point. Remember, your guess that's 80% is better than staying quiet. All right? I'm going to be impressed with you throwing a hand up and being wrong. I am not going to be impressed with silence and hoping somebody else gets it wrong first. Somebody else who gets it wrong first is the one who learns fastest. What's that? It is. It's a standard set for processing things through the web that all things can then start to abide by. What do you think that, what's that, Rachel? Standard file extensions. Standard file extensions, st standard ways of communicating. What does that mean? What does that say to you? Pass someone's keys right inside on the thing. Oh, cool. Yeah, pass them to somebody. Anyone's I, I, keys? Anybody lose, nobody loses their keys, right? If okay. anybody comes around looking for the keys, cool. I took them down to the computer lab. Killer. Awesome. Wait, I think that's mine. Oh, Are good. They? Oh, good really? deal. That's fine. Very good. Excellent. Okay. Hey, that's a really good example for Internet of Things. Okay. What just happened? An exchange from two people over what? Voice. Over voice, yes. About what? A thing, right? Exactly. Okay, so that exchange happened. Why was that exchange understood by both parties? Because they had a bingo right there. They had the same language that they were speaking. That is exactly it. And that's why that transaction went as fast as possible. Hey, there's a thing here. Does it belong to anybody? Lo, for that is my thing. OK, here it is. You look trustworthy. OK, so in computers, we, we make it go through a little bit more than that to prove you are who you say you are. But we'll call it a handshake mechanism for now. Yes, those are probably your keys. I'm 99.7% sure that those are your keys because you're looking me in the eyes right now and you seem pretty trustworthy. So I don't know. My, my meter's been off before, but I am a poker player. And I'm going to buy that those are your keys. So, But that exchange happened because you have a common language right? that, that you can both speak. What happens when all computers speak the same language? Faster communication. What else? They get along. They get, they get along. They like each other. What else happens? What translates between two computers that do not speak the same language right now? Error version. I've heard nothing. Error. File version. What happens when two computers don't speak the same language? What has to happen? Somebody's got to translate. Somebody's got to translate. All right takes more time. Right. And that moment where you take two computers and you translate back and forth, that, that's the thing that people are for, right? What happens when you don't need people to do that anymore? Less confusion. Less confusion. Less time I haven't heard Terminator yet, and I'm kind of disappointed about it. OK. Anybody? The beginning of all of the stuff on Earth being connected to one another. How many of you guys watch The Good Wife? Folks, folks, I keep trying to not say guys. How many of you people watch The Good Wife? You watch it? I totally love trashy, trashy, terrible television. We've, we've established this clearly before. Um, so I watched that show, and uh, one of the most recent episodes was about a car hacking incident, right? Because you can hack cars now. Some of the, and we're going to talk actually more about that tomorrow, and it's super interesting and fascinating. But what happens when you can hack someone's car that you don't like from a 1,000 miles away? Make them drive it off a cliff? Make them drive it off a cliff, run through a stop sign, something a little bit more subtle maybe, with just a little side swipe at the right time, at the right place. Yes? You had a, you had a hand raised? No. Okay. I swear to God, you're always like, yeah, and then I'm like, oh, and then no. Okay, fine. You're just chilling. Okay, that's cool. All right. I thought I was being inspirational here. All right. So the, those are the kinds of things that can happen when you have a, a piece of equipment that someone is using that you can access from a far distant place. Right? 
Okay, so if that's what happens when you can access something from a far distant place, what happens when it's not even required that you access it anymore? It just sits in the background. That's the interesting portion of this. There's stuff, we call it the Internet of Things for a reason. There's stuff happening in the background that we're not paying attention to anymore. Not that we don't necessarily understand, but that we don't pay attention to, that we don't have to pay attention to. What happens when your refrigerator tells the grocery store that you want something, orders food, and keeps itself restocked? That's cool. It's totally cool, right? Technology's so awesome. We live in the future. To keep that up, though. What's that? Assuming you have the budget to keep that up, though. And then what happens when your refrigerator needs a little bit of uh, connectivity to your bank account to make sure that you've got it stocked up? Then you've got to worry about security. <laughs> Interesting. Yes? My own vending machine. Your own vending machine. That, that actually functionally is what your refrigerator would turn into, right? Would be your own vending machine. What happens when you can hook up an, a, um, a Wi-Fi enabled refrigerator with Amazon Fresh? <laughs> right? Well, then everything's get delivered. What's that? Yes. <laughs> It would know when you're low on something. How would it know? What do you think the mechanism might be? What would tell them? Alexa would tell them. Maybe have like a little interface where you can list what items you don't have. Okay. Could be a weight system. Could be a weight system. I like that one. Okay. What about a video camera? The tags for SKUs or UPCs inside your phone or inside your refrigerator? RFID chip. There we go. You have to have somebody else looking over at the camera. Uh -huh. Barcodes. Sure. What else? What else would you have inside this magic, magic refrigerator that I'm now kind of wanting to do a web series about? Sensors. Sensors. Okay. What else would you have in there? Uh, time control for expiration. Time control for expiration dates. That's killer. Okay. What else? Sounds pretty reasonable. I, what What do you name your refrigerator? Did I hear a Bob? I approve. Bob the refrigerator. It would have to be a name that you mm -hmm. don't normally use so it doesn't just start talking back to you when you're in that normal conversation. Quincy. I Quincy. feel Quincy's a solid name for, for the refrigerator now. If we're not going to use it in regular conversation, Quincy's a solid name for that. No, a bow-wielding assassin. A bow-wielding assassin. All right. Yeah. New favorite student. Okay. So why am I naming the refrigerator? So you can communicate with it. So I can communicate with it. What do we communicate with? Who do we talk to? Speech AI program, but but in 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 human language, who do we bother talking to? Do we do we talk to plants? We talk to cats? People? Some of us talk to cats. Some of us talk to cats. <laughs> right. So that's hey, cats are awesome listeners, and they like produce a public good, which is warmth and fuzziness and purrs. You know, and also the sticky bits inside my thigh earlier from when Frankie decided to launch. Um, and then I picked him up and I, I kind of like had him on my shoulder right here and then I just like threw him like a javelin because I had like a shoulder mounted kitten launcher at that point. Yeah. Crawls on. Oh, it's so painful when they do that and they like get a, like a chunk right out of the shoulder. Right. So the reason why we're naming the refrigerator is because now the refrigerator is has agency, right? The capacity to do a thing in a way that we hadn't really thought about before. People anthropomorphize their cars, their phones. Um, people anthropomorphize their houses. They, they, turn, they, they turn something that they don't necessarily always understand into something familiar by giving it a name, right? All right. This matters in terms of the semantic web, in terms of the Internet of Things, because what we're doing is we're trying to fuzz up and make more cheerful something that we don't truly understand. Right? What have, we, what have we done in the past naming things like that that has helped us to anthropomorphize something that might be scary? A pet. A pet. Hurricanes. Hurricanes. Earth. 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 Yes. Big boy. Right? The bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yeah. Yeah. Fat man and big boy, right? So these are these are the ways. Yes, go ahead. Oh, I have my hand See, and yeah, and I'm always just like, okay. The reason that we do this is because we're trying to grow familiar with something that is a little bit scary. And the notion of basically every device in your house, and everything on your person communicating with one another, um, is it, it's kind of a frightening concept, right? What if I've got an Arduino sensor in my clothes that reports via my phone and an application about my bodily state? 
What if I have something? See, it, you're you, you're kind of giving me the eyeballs right now. But what if I've got a a a an, a sensor inside my clothes that says to my house, "It's really cold outside," and she's really cold. I'm gonna jack the heat by like 10 degrees and then gradually cool it off as she gets inside the house for a little bit of time. Or maybe that's what starts the coffee maker when I come back in in the morning. Like my approach to the house starts the coffee pot going so that by the time I walk in the door, it's 10 minutes later and there's a coffee pot going because I just got back from my run. Is this awesome or scary? Both. Thank you, I heard a yes and a both, exactly. That is exactly what it is. It is both scary and awesome. So the reason we're talking about the Internet of Things this week, and this is more of a concept of the notion of these things all being interconnected, is so that when we talk about the scary parts tomorrow and then the awesome stuff on Wednesday, you've got a context for why it is that these things are scary or awesome. What questions do you have about the definition of the semantic web? And remember, we're talking about a language structure in the semantic web and the physical existence of those things in the Internet of Things. Okay? What questions do you have? Uh, yes? Is it actually like a specific thing, or is it a system? Is what a specific thing or a system? Is the semantic web like a, a specific like ah. of the web, or is it a system of just having a bunch of things be similar? It is thing? halfway between a language and a thought experiment. It is a standard set and a framework for how to get things to talk to one another um, that has been partially or poorly implemented and has a great deal of potential. It is the Esperanto of computers. Okay. A lot of people are working on that problem, the Esperanto of computers, from a lot of different directions. I've mentioned that natural language processing stuff before when we talked about um, the, the design of, of technical languages. That's a direction from which you can approach this. You can approach it from a very technical standpoint that just says every computer should be able to talk to each other using the exact same language. Here's that language, I'm right, go. And lots of companies have tried that and lots of companies have failed. No one has completely succeeded in pushing a full standard out to every machine out there at all. And it's because of the competition between makers. Thank you, Steve Jobs who decided that every single one of the connections that goes into an Apple should be totally different than anything else that goes anywhere ever else, right? If he could have reinvented USB, he would have. How many of you guys saw Jobs? Folks, people, Jobs. Okay, this, the new one that just came out? Okay, so Fassbender or Kutcher? What are we thinking? Who's better? You saw the, the Steve Jobs one from like a year ago, right? Ashton Kutcher? Anybody see that at all? Okay, which one's better? There's a right answer to this question. Yeah, go ahead. I've just heard a lot of complaints about this new one. People say it's not as accurate. Not as accurate. It's, it's based on an autobiography, not from the autobiography. No, wait. Inspired by an autobiography. And then the, 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 the script was by Aaron Sorkin. It's, not, it's, barely, it's barely real at this point, much less true to the story. But I thought it did a great job telling the story. And one of the things that it really hit hard was the, de the demand for a closed system in terms of Apple computers and, and the, the, the hardware design on those machines. Why, what is, the semantic web is the ultimate in what kind of system? An, an open system, exactly. So why are we trending in the direction of an open system? Why would we do that instead of a closed system that can be theoretically perfectly designed, executed, and shipped? So people can do things how they want. And more advances can be discovered. And more advances can be. Why are more advances being discovered in an open system rather than a closed one? Which, by the way, new favorite student again. Wait, no, still favorite student. Go. Um, because if it's an open source, then you're accepting mm -hmm. everything and then going over everything, which has possibilities of leading to new design. If you have a closed Kay. system, then you're only looking at specific things, and it's kind of hard to discover new things within mm -hmm. the same system. So you can't get your hands on it to, to, to tinker, basically. Yeah. OK. I mean, you're just yes. Yeah. Over well, there is a there is an, an aphorism on the web. Given enough eyes, all bugs are shallow, right? So that's what the this concept. Do you understand what I mean when I say given enough eyes, all bugs are shallow? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. Exactly. It means that given enough people looking at a problem, you can subdivide the problem sufficiently enough that a, a large number of people can handle it, right? Um, and and there's a reason why I I do what I do in terms of 
of running this class and the kind of freedom that I give you all in here. I, I mean, I see some of you folks playing video games as you're doing this or watching things or um, processing information all at the same time on multiple tracks. And not only am I okay with it, I want you to do it. I don't process a single thing at a time and it drove me crazy in academia when people wanted my full attention. And I'm like, you're using exactly 2% of my brain power right now. Let me get more crap done. Right? Let me process in my own way. And in a lot of ways, an open system is like that. It lets you utilize the full bandwidth that any machine or any concept or any system has. Right? So if you've heard of the, the SETI project that will use unused computing cycles on your computer if you install the software and it'll help process through the, uh, the raw data, raw radio waves coming in from the universe so that we can try to identify signs of extraterrestrial life. Right? That is SETI, a very early, that's Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, by the way, that's the organization out of like New Mexico. Um, and what they're doing is they're utilizing an entire web of people who don't have to think about it, of computing power that would go otherwise unused to help them solve a problem in a way that you don't have to think about it. There are people whose machines right now are being used without them even noticing it. Well, they know about it, but they're not noticing it to search for extraterrestrial intelligence, which is really, in, is really intriguing and interesting to me, and that's where a lot of these concepts come from, is there's an unused amount of stuff that's perpetually being used and tied up in resources. Let me give you an example. If you have a car, how many hours a day do you drive it? Two hours. Two hours a day, probably, is how much you drive the car. So you're tying up an awful lot of carbon and gasoline and, and motor power for 22 hours out of the day that's just sitting there waiting on you, right? Doing nothing but just sitting there and rusting and waiting, right? Yes? Cool. Yeah, exactly. What if your car knew to do something different? What if you could volunteer six hours out of your car's day that you're not using for people who have low income to go to the grocery store, right? What if you could volunteer your car to be unmanned cargo delivery for a food bank in town? That's coming, where you can turn your, your possessions into something that is a shared prospect for a lot of different people. And that's, I think, one of the most exciting parts about all this. There's scary bits, and then there's just amazing bits of this. If you could think of anything you would want your car to be doing while you weren't driving it, what would that thing be? Helping others. Helping others. That's awesome. What if you could turn your car loose to make you money? What if you devoted half of its time to going and helping out low-income families and the other half of the time someone could jump in it for a ride and you got paid $3 an hour? As long as you don't have to pay for the gas. As long as you don't have to pay for the gas. Or it's built in as a price, right? This is the kind of exciting stuff that's coming with the Internet of Things, with the concept of all of these machines talking to each other. And now, what's the scary part of this? Terrorism. It Terrorism. Well, it demands for better security because better security is needed. Okay. All right. And then, you still haven't pushed it quite quite far enough. What's the scary thing about all these machines talking to each other? Skynet. What's that? Skynet. Skynet. Thank you. <laughs> End of lecture.